Central Pacific surf thunders onto a ring of reefs about the island. Leave the booming waves. Come in across the warm lagoon and meet the Polynesians of the Cook Islands. These are New Zealanders. Like the native New Zealanders, they are proud to call themselves Maoris. The Maoris of the Cook Islands. With the trade wind singing in the palms, they put on fancy dress and greet you with a dance as colourful as a Rarotong and door. The graceful rhythms of these happy people are in tune with their environment, reflect their way of life, their lovely island home. The 15 Cook Islands, 1,600 miles northwest of New Zealand, are New Zealand territory. Some are volcanic with deep jungles sweeping up from the flats bordering the lagoons to high precipitous peaks. Others are atolls, small low areas of coral sand risen on the reef swinging the lagoons. Here little grows but the faithful coconut. On most islands, though, the scent of flowers is always on the wind's breath, and the people pluck them as they pass and wear them always. The Māoris in the Cooks live a communal village life much as the New Zealand Māoris did 60 years ago. The tempo is slow, unhurried. The warm days drift away. <laughs> The drum dance is the real dance of the Cook Islands, and they beat the rhythms out on anything. When the Maoris hear the throb of the party, they are drawn to it like children and flock to the roadsides for the news of the cowboy film the cinema will screen. On some islands, the women weave exquisitely, patiently fashioning the finest mats, baskets and hats. The hats are trimmed with colourful woven flowers and are worn on Sundays. The early missionaries taught the people that Sunday was the Lord's Day. They believed, and this day for them is one of worship. With the arrival of Europeans in the Cooks came civilization. And today the islanders are adapting themselves slowly to a different way of life. Some of the simplicity is going, especially among the younger people. 
but one thing they've retained, their gaiety, their light-hearted attitude to living. They have much in common with the Maoris of New Zealand. In fact, it's said that it was from this bay that the canoes sailed for New Zealand far back in the Polynesian past. The Cook Islands are administered by New Zealand, whose policy is to lead the people patiently toward a greater self-reliance, really to help them help themselves. The local parliament of the 15 islands is about to meet. The Europeans have one representative, five are from the administration, and the remaining 21 are Maoris elected by their people. Some of these are women arikis. Together they are solving many of the problems common in the Pacific today. The island economy is based on the land. The Maoris say the land is a mother who will provide. And certainly she provides in abundance. Around the houses, the islanders grow tomatoes, kumara, taro and other crops. While in the clearings are rows of arrowroot. On some islands, pineapples. The hanging bud of the banana is seen everywhere, and each day another hand of bananas turns upward to the island sun. Taro likes water, and the scores of small plots belong to separate families who cultivate and care for them. The tops of the leaves are eaten like cabbage, but the thick white roots have been the Maori's staple food for generations. Islanders won't barter land so it's divided into smaller and smaller pieces as fathers leave it to their children, and few own plots large enough to cultivate mechanically. The coconut is the life of tropical islands. From the coconut comes food, drink, shelter, fuel and clothing. But for these graceful trees, built to withstand the hurricane winds, human life would be impossible on many of the adults. A drinking nut must be kicked from the tree, for it's still green. The rough fibre packing is almost impenetrable to a European, but the Maoris make short work of it. The shell is white and soft. The nuts brim full of a clear, sparkling liquid, quite unlike the milk in a mature nut. And thanks to the refrigerating husk, it's wonderfully cold and refreshing. The brown ripe nuts are husked and dried and the meat scooped out. This is copra for oils and margarine, and one of the main exports from the cooks, one which could be increased considerably. The administration's persuading the islanders to work cooperatively and prepare it carefully, for the price is high only when the copper is of good quality. This they do with enthusiasm and gaiety. But to prompt them to farm the trees scientifically is more difficult. A coconut palm is revered and must not be felled. So many trees, perhaps a hundred years old, grow where the nuts once fell and smother one another into sterility. Pearl shell is another important export from the Northern Islands. They find some pearls, but it's the beautiful shell itself that's in demand for buttons and ornaments. The fisheries department is maintaining and conserving the shell in the northern lagoons and it's also transferring live shell to islands where it's unknown. It's moved carefully from the carrying tanks of running seawater to smaller tanks that will fit into a canoe. Finally the shells are released and sink down through the limpid waters of new lagoons to multiply and grow. As you'd expect, it's on the sea that the islanders rely for much of their food. But it's not as generous as the Earth Mother. It yields reluctantly, and many of its gifts are rare enough to cause quite a bit of excitement.
There is food on the reefs, but the harvest is sometimes small. The administration is experimenting with the trochus, a shellfish flown across from Fiji. The live young trochus are being planted on selected reefs. They grow rapidly and can provide an easily gathered food supply, and the shell itself is valuable. Nearly all the fishing is in the lagoons. To get out over the reefs is difficult, and dangerous in small canoes. If the sea isn't generous, the land will provide. But patience is required to capture the land crabs. At the slightest hint of danger, they scuttle into their holes. They must be lured out into the open. Then all you have to do is pick them up, if you dare. As the New Zealand Maoris did, the islanders generally steam their food in the ground. A fire is made in a hole and covered with stones. When they are hot, the food is placed over them. White chunks of taro, fish, banana and arrowroot wrapped neatly in leaves. When the meal's on, it's covered with a lid of leaves sewn with their own stems and left to steam over the hot stones. In a few hours, the perfectly cooked food will be ready. There's another type of oven in most villages, but people are inclining to make new baked bread and tinned meat their staple diet, to the detriment of their teeth and health. When a fresh batch of bread is ready, a baker's boy often spreads the news round the village. The houses in some of the villages are bad. Timber doesn't grow in the cooks, and after a hurricane, a shelter is often made from scraps of iron and wood. But many families take pride in their homes and are always trying to improve them and make them more permanent. Naturally, most use native building materials, but these have a fairly short life. Kikau, plattered coconut leaf, lasts only a few years before it has to be renewed. The pandanus tree flourishes on some islands. This is the leaf often used to weave mats. Pandanus thatch is better than coconut and lasts about twice as long. New houses sometimes replace old ones in poor or damp places, as naturally it's difficult to persuade people to move from the site the family has occupied for generations. On the other hand, although they say it's unlucky to interfere with the crumbling walls of a place unroofed by a hurricane, the owner will sometimes risk misfortune to clear a good building site for himself. To encourage a new outlook on housing, loans are available for simple, practical houses that are popular, but not everybody can afford one. Coral has meant the end of many a ship, but without the protecting reefs of coral, the islands would be uninhabitable. It's being put to good use today as coral rocks are stacked and packed with wood. The piles fired under the supervision of the works department. It burns for seven days and the coral becomes a lime powder. Coral is now an inexhaustible building material. Mixed with water, sand and coral gravel, it forms a cement. 
houses, schools and hospitals are going up without having to wait for funds to import timber and cement from over the sea. Coral again is the base for the plaster used to waterproof the new buildings. The islanders realize that they must sell something to the outside world. Like copra, oranges are a natural crop in this climate. The administration helps by supplying young trees and showing growers how to cultivate them. But people without the habit of fearing for the future can't grasp the idea sometimes that care and attention today will mean larger crops tomorrow. The gathered crop has to be sent to market across a lonely sea and the men ferry their precious cargoes out through the rough passage in the reef. But on most islands there's no passage through the coral. Then the fruit's carried out at low tide to the boats which are pushed off the reef into the oncoming swell. When the seas rise and the ships can't risk staying, it's possible that some of the crop will be left behind. They are planning to take a little of the uncertainty out of this way of making a living. Gaps are being blasted in some of the reefs. The islanders are enthusiastic when they realize what this breach in the reef will mean. The whole population, men and women, young and old, start clearing and building a basin where their small boats can be loaded safely and rowed out in comparatively calm water. With a helping hand to guide them toward better things, they work with a will. This they're doing too on a cool store to keep fruit until it can be shipped away. On experimental farms, less perishable crops are being investigated. Peanuts, for instance, grow easily. Coffee seedlings too are doing well. When the bushes are mature, the berries are gathered. There are two coffee beans in each berry and these make an excellent brew. Albizia seedlings are reared and transplanted. There's no timber in the islands, even fruit cases have to be imported. But the Albizias are thriving and may solve some problems. The mosquito boys, as they call them, are helping in the wholesale drive against mosquitoes and disease, and apathy. It's sometimes hard to make the cheerful islander understand that better health would bring him greater happiness. Gradually though, they're using the health services and having their houses protected from vermin and insects. Children are taught to look after their teeth, a precaution so necessary as their diet begins to include European food. Pupils come to this new special school by the lagoon from all the islands, for they are lepers. By isolating them and using new drugs, the disease is gradually coming under control. The ordinary schools of the older type are picturesque, but they are hardly satisfactory for modern teaching methods. While the boys spin their tops like any school children, the girls have an unusual race to see who can make the best basket in the shortest time from half a coconut leaf. The people are enthusiastic about education and parents and men of a village fall too willingly to clear land for a school project. Each new school has a hard roof for rainwater collected on the school and church provides the only water supply on many of the islands. 
The brightest pupils from each island come to Terraora College for a secondary education. A teacher's training college too has been opened. These serious young people with their clear eyes and velvet voices go back to the schools and take the wisdom of a new civilization to still younger generations. Many of the schools have a roll of over 500, for in the Cooks today, half the population are under 16. What all these children will do when they leave school is a problem, for most young people are reluctant to return to the land and their simple village life. Once the Maori's needs were simple, but those days have gone forever. Although their happy Polynesian philosophy still shows plainly through the thin disguise of European clothes, they need money today for better housing, food, clothing, entertainment. For the brighter adolescents, the administration itself offers the best opportunity. Radio is the link with the other islands and the distant world, and all the senior operators are now Maoris. Island candidates are trained and find satisfying work helping to administer the free medical treatment in the villages, hospitals and sanatoriums. They work in clinics too, where all school children get free dental care. A second group finds work in the few small industries. The more adventurers go to New Zealand, and on boat days the people gather to get the mail from their loved ones, settling into the strange environment of the cities over the sea. From the wall newspaper they read of the simple happenings in their tiny islands and of the complicated problems in the big islands, the continents, the other world over the sea. A few wonder where the future lies. The rest live in the carefree present and dance. With their quick smiles and generous hearts, the people of the Cook Islands follow the rhythm of their island lives. But the pace is changing, and in the song of the drums drifting out across the lagoon, echoes the question, what will be the rhythm of tomorrow? 